Welcome. My name is Jacqueline Liu, MBA 2011, and I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Renee Richardson Goslin, Assistant Professor of Marketing at MIT Sloan School of Management. Renee has been named one of the world's top 40 professors under 40 by Poets and Quants, an MIT Iron Professor, and a scholar at the MIT Center for Digital Business. Her main interest is in behavioral science, the study of how rational people make irrational choices when social structure influences them. She is an expert in branding, leadership, and technology, frequently linking these together by investigating how status-based bias and technology affect self-perceptions and behavior. Professor Goslin's research projects include the positive impact of imitation on brand strength, the effect of social media storytelling on persuasion, the role of status dynamics in unconscious bias, performance, and even health behaviors, and the use of wearable technology to aid willpower. Today, Renee has joined us to discuss how consumer behavior in the digital space can enable identity work when we are able to enhance our digital extended selves. Please join me in welcoming Renee Richardson Goslin. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to see you. I'm especially happy to see some familiar faces. It's one thing to have students kind of at your mercy in a classroom, but when they actually choose to come back to hear you speak <laughs> at a reunion, I feel really good about myself today. I'm on a high because yesterday was graduation. I got to wear my wizard gown, which is what all the doctoral <laughs> gowns look like. I didn't have a wand, but it was pretty ridiculous looking. And I got lots of hugs, and I got to hear Matt Damon, which is always a good thing, too. So I'm feeling good today, and I hope you are, too. Welcome back to Sloan. It may look a little different than last time uh, you were here. And uh, hopefully, you're feeling at home uh, and seeing some familiar faces. So today, I'd like to talk to you about a concept that sounds a little strange, which is relationships between people individuals like yourselves, and uh, inanimate objects like firms or phones or wearables and things of that nature. Relationships that we probably won't admit that are important to us. You know, when we think about the most important relationships in our lives, we think of family members. I know I definitely think of my dog. Um, but maybe not inanimate objects. And so I want to think about today how technology is changing the way we make decisions for the better and sometimes for the worse. And I, I, I guess I will do spoiler alert and tell you at the very beginning that it's important when we are thinking about, as managers, how we affect the way people make decisions, we don't have an under-socialized or over-socialized view of the process by which we make choices. So I'm going to show you a pretty classic image. This is the iceberg that represents your mind. Now, here at MIT, uh, I don't claim to be an engineer. I'm maybe an imposter. Um, but I do work with a lot of engineers. And I do a lot of research uh, at the IDE, which is the newly formed initiative on the digital economy. And there, we've got kind of, it's like the super friends. You know, we've got Batman, Superman. I'm hoping I'm Wonder Woman. And um, we look at different things. Right? And so we've got kind of a pillar. People look at how this is changing labor, right? robots taking your jobs. We've got another pillar where people are looking at privacy, right? how these data are used uh, beneficially or sometimes not so beneficially. And then we have the pillar that I represent, and that's the behavioral science pillar. I try to not forget the human in the technology or the digital revolution. And so I'm showing you this because this iceberg represents the human mind the brilliant human mind. And what do we know about icebergs? What you can see is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Hence the phrase. And most of the iceberg is beneath the surface. And the human mind kind of works that way too. In that no matter how intelligent you are, and we know that you guys are really intelligent, no matter how intelligent you are, you can only consciously process about as much information as fits on a post-it note, right? So, once again, even the most intelligent on the planet, we've got a large portion uh, gathered here, can only process what I'm saying to you, what you're hearing me say deliberately, and this picture, for instance. And maybe you're thinking, I should have had breakfast, I'm a little hungry, or something like that. 
but the bulk of the work happens beneath the surface, right? And this is kind of like the supercomputer that you would find at NASA. This is where all the heavy lifting is done. And thank goodness for this supercomputer, because without it, you'd have to be sitting here telling yourself, heart, don't forget to beat. Lungs, don't forget to breathe. And you pretty much wouldn't have time to do much else. You certainly wouldn't have had time to come to slow. Um, so this is pretty incredible that our brains work this way. And one of the ways in which we become more efficient in making decisions is we get these non-conscious things to act on our, conscience, our conscious mind, and they're called heuristics. And heuristics are just shortcuts. They're ways in which you differentiate between options in your world based on constructs that are pre-existing. That's why marketing is so powerful, because you go into the cereal aisle, you see a 1,000 cereals. You don't need to re read each individual box. You see the symbol for Kellogg's, and you say, oh, OK, Tony the Tiger, I get it. Now, the thing about our brains is that they're efficient, these heuristics, but they're also prone to bias. And those biases can sometimes lead us to suboptimal choices. For instance, in experiments, people were given uh, cognitive tasks, so math problems, verbal problems. And in one condition, they were randomly assigned to complete these tasks with a pen that had the MIT logo on it. And in the other condition, they were given pens with no logo. And in this condition here with the MIT pen, they felt more intelligent. <laughs> So the coop, where's the coop? Um, the coop is over here, I think. So definitely make sure you pick up some of those pens. Um, another experiment using wine, right? People were randomly assigned to two conditions where they had cocktail receptions. And in one condition, people received wine with the label from France. And in the other, the label from North Dakota. Now, I don't know about you, I've had a little bit of wine in my day. Um, I don't really think about North Dakota when I think of wine. And in fact, though the wine was exactly the same, just simply in different labeled bottles, people felt that the wine in the French condition was more delicious. <laughs> they also said that the people at the event were more charming. <laughs> and the food was tastier. So dinner party time, remember that when you're thinking about what wine you should bring. And then we have things that send us non-conscious signals all the time. So with research in experiments, when doing experiments where people were asked to inflict pain or to lie or to sound more sort of authorita authoritative on a, a topic, simply by wearing a white lab coat you can increase people's likelihood of going along with what you tell them to do, even if that includes shock treatment to other people, right? So when I do experiments here in the lab, I wear my white coat. I don't do shock treatment. Um, but you do find people are more compliant. Now, all of this is very interesting in terms of how our minds work. But again, our minds are prone to bias. We make decisions with this amazing supercomputer that we have been born with. But it is subject to notice things that we don't think we're noticing. You're noticing that I'm a woman. You're noticing my age or an accent. Yes. Very quickly, on yes. The end, you said people felt smarter. Did they do better, or they just felt smarter? <laughs> that is a very good question. In this study, they felt smarter. In other research that I have done, they do worse. <laughs> They do worse with MIT pens. So I'll tell you what doesn't. You shouldn't go to the coop. <laughs> you should go to the coop if. Here's the proviso, right? They do poorly with MIT pens. Now, mind you, there's no difference in effort in these results. So it's not like some people are working more diligently than others. There's no difference in time spent. What the difference is, is in their perception of how psychologically close or distant they are to the prototypical MIT student. So when you envision MIT, what comes to mind? What's that now? You can say it. it's We're all friends. <laughs>
geniuses. You may have seen the hashtag or the shirts, nerd pride, you know, that sort of a thing. Yeah, you know, embrace that. The thing about it is when people who are not MIT people do this and they use MIT pens, they are unconsciously reminded of how psychologically they dis distant they are from this goal. We did this research again with MIT students and we did an experiment where in one condition we told them about a fellow student who was like them. Uh, we gave him the name Eric and we said in one condition Eric is at MIT and he's doing really, really well and we, um, we activated the similarity. And in the other condition we activated the similarity and told them that Eric was doing very poorly at MIT, he was really struggling. And in a third control condition there was no mention of a reference point Eric. And what we found there is you can turn off that effect of people doing poorly when they believe that they are psychologically close to someone who's doing well. So you assimilate toward a reference point that's similar to you and doing well, and you have contrast effects from a reference point that is similar to you and doing poorly. What this means, the implication for this is not whether or not you should use MIT pens, the implication is that when you get to MIT, it is important that you make sure people feel like they belong there. Because you can have someone who's brilliant and objectively intelligent, but let's say they're the first person in their family to go to college, like me. They may get here and feel like I don't belong, and in that case, their performance can suffer. This is another reason why we find women and people of color, their attrition rate tends to be much higher when they break into uh, organizations that are traditionally not uh, including people like them. So that is a very good question. I could go on on this all day. You know, the nerd thing, I can talk <laughs> about my experience. We'll talk. I'm from New York, we'll talk. <laughs> all right, good. So we have all these biases that are pushing us in one way or the other, oftentimes not in the best direction, even though we ha uh, intend to. So we, do, we, we, we are able to use as a tool nudges that may help us improve our judgments. Now you may be familiar with the book Nudge by Dick Thaler. It's a very popular sort of notion within be behavioral economics. And what is a nudge other than a slight push? It is a method of influencing your behavior by changing your context, changing the way, uh, the place around you and it unconsciously moves you in one direction or the other. I'll give you some examples of nudges. For example, in the use of uh, energy, energy reduction. People receive their energy bills, and in one condition, they receive an energy bill that says, you use X amount of kilowatts this month. Okay, here's your bill, you owe us this amount of money. In the other condition, you owe the same amount of money, but it says, you used X percent more kilowatts this month than your neighbors. Same amount of kilowatts used, same money that you owe. Simply that nudge of your being more wasteful than your neighbor has led to a reduction in energy on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Right? There's a nudge. Another nudge. When you see bins to throw away the trash, you may see a regular trash bin, you may see a recycling bin, and maybe the recycling bin is colored blue or green. But a nudge that can actually improve compliance with waste reductive behavior and environmentally uh, protective behaviors is one where you have these bins next to one another and on the trash bin there's a sticker that says landfill. Not trash, landfill. And moreover, it says which landfill? And it lists the landfill closest to you. Okay? What we find when we do that is that people are far less likely to throw recyclable items into the trash. Why? Because it nudges you toward thinking that this is going into my neighborhood, into my area, into my landfill. And that leads to very different behaviors, right? So when we think about what is a nudge, they're really effective in affecting the automatic responses, right? So I'm not thinking much about throwing the trash and ooh, I just got a little nudge and it pointed me in the right direction. 
I'm not poring over this monthly bill in the way that I would a novel, but because I give it a cursory glance, that's exactly why a nudge can work. Versus a reflective type brain system where maybe you're doing your taxes and you're really being highly analytical, nudges aren't as, as effective. So, you know, I think about technology and how all of this interacts all day, every day. And these opportunities for nudges abound in the Internet of Things context. And we're doing a lot of this work here. And I'm really fortunate to be at a place like MIT where I get to play with this stuff and think about the human uh, choice. So new touch points including wearables, right? Including augmented reality, including soon self-driving vehicles, um, and all other types of technology that can ostensibly help you make better decisions. And this is a really exciting time then because our choices and the power, the locus of power where these choices are being held has shifted. You know, you think about the old school Mad Men where the marketer controlled is kind of like almost like a Geppetto type metaphor where we make the ads, you buy the products. It was a simpler time, although I'm not sure that time ever really existed. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got consumer control, right? The consumer empowerment age. Here's a recent advertising age cover that said agency of the year, the consumer. Time magazine cover, person of the year, you. You control the experience. And so we have these notions of the power is here with the firm or the power is there with the consumer. But in actuality, what happens with digital is that digital is mediating that relationship where the firm can connect to you through a digital platform. You feed that platform information. You give it permission. The firm takes that information, pivots accordingly, and that relationship is dynamic. So no longer are we talking about a B2C dynamic. We're talking about B to C and a C to another C and then a C back to the B, who then talks to another B and then back to the C. It's really far more nuanced and complicated than traditional notions. So trust, then, is a heuristic that we need to think about. As I talked about heuristics earlier, because now there's more information. We're given more opportunity to abdicate control. And therefore, the ability to trust helps us be more efficient, helps us say, ah, I trust that company. I trust that firm. I trust this digital product to help me do better. So let me ask you, when you think about what is a best friend, what adjectives come to mind? What's it, what makes a friend a best friend, even? What adjectives? Yes? Reliability. Reliability. Very good, yes. Knowing that they have your back, for lack of a better term, um, is, is very important. Other notions of what's a, good, a best friend? Yes? Trust. Trust. Absolutely. You're hoping that if you tell your best friend what happened last weekend, they'll keep it to themselves. Yes? Respect. Respect. I feel like my best friend will not disrespect me or treat me in a fashion that is undermining my identity. Yes, sir. Emotionally intelligent. Emotionally intelligent. I love that. I love it. Yes. With a best friend, I mean, how many people have a friend that you can just give a look and they understand what's going on? We don't even have to say a word, right? Just even the, the look of, can you believe this? Is, is enough to convey. I thought I saw another hand in the neighborhood here. Yes? Well, maybe it was. Yes? My friend and me, they say money. Money. <laughs> or at least paying back money if you borrow. <laughs> sure, sure. At least pay back money if you borrow. Yes? <laughs> Love, affection, care. Absolutely. Right? You get an emotional feeling. It's an experience with your best friend, right? To go someplace with your friend, you know that the experience will be enhanced. Yes? Looking for your best interest. Looking out for your best interest. 
very much so. So this is part of, I think, the trust that this lady spoke about before, which is, I know that you have my back because you have my best interest in, in heart. Yes? Not expecting it to be evenly give and take. Yes. Without expectation of getting paid out. Right. So sometimes this person will just take care of you and not expect anything in return. And, and you feel like you can take care of them and not expect anything in return because you're not doing a mental accounting, you know? It's a long-term relationship. So it's not like looking at the bill and we've got to split it exactly down the middle, right? Yes? It's just an experience and history with that person. Yes. You can't be emotionally intelligent if you don't know me. Right? If I give you the look, how are you going to accurately interpret it as, can you believe this, versus I have something in my eye? Right? <laughs> you got to know me well enough to interpret what I'm saying. I thought I saw a hand in this neighborhood. Yes? Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Absolutely. Have my back, for sure. So what's funny is when we think about what makes a best friend, we rarely think about inanimate objects. Yet, when it comes to smartphones, turns out they're the first thing we see when we wake up. <laughs> they're the last thing we touch when we go to bed at night. <laughs> they're with us always. We check in on them. Are you feeling well? Are you 50% battery? <laughs> we go out to a quiet candlelit dinner. They might be right there on the table with us, <laughs> right? And if you've ever misplaced or lost your smartphone, <laughs> no one move, <laughs> right? Now, I bring this up because it turns, as it turns out, the words that you use to describe best friends are being used by consumers to describe the role that different companies have in their lives. And I'd like to share with you this idea of a resonance pyramid. And those of you who've taken my class, I'm not going to test you now, but this should look familiar. Turns out that relationships we have with one another as individuals really do reflect or have something in common with the relationships we have with firms. Here's how a resonance pyramid works. It starts with salience. Salience merely means I know who you are. So you may not have known that I existed before today, but now I'm salient. I'm standing in front of you and speaking. Now, the next level up this pyramid, though, is performance and imagery. So it's not what are you. It's who are you and what do you do, right? So you see me. You know because of the introduction who I am here at MIT and what I do. I'm a professor. I focus on behavioral science. The next level, though, talks about judgments and feelings. So it's not just, I know you exist, you're salient, and I know what you do, but also, how do I feel about what you do? So you think to yourself, this person seems capable, I'm hoping. Um, and you go up that resonance pyramid where you start to develop judgments and feelings. The problem is that most firms stop there. That's their goal, to build positive, hopefully positive affect. So you spend lots and lots of money on advertising, let's say, to become salient and to say we're good and we're good for you in what we do. But what, we, what you want to do is you want to get up to the resonance pyramid. And resonance says, what about you and me? What do you mean in my life? If you are a brand, perhaps like mobile, when you go to pump gas, you may say, oh, I need gas. The light just went on. Here's a mobile. They provide gas, and that's it. You may lack loyalty to mobile gas because you don't care which gas company you get the, mobile, the, the gas from. It's just mobile happens to be there. You know that they provide gas. We'll go with mobile. But what you want to be able to do is go up that resonance pyramid and achieve resonance, right? Like a brand, like Apple has, where people say, this speaks to who I am. This is cool. This is creative. I'm that kind of person. 
And before even Apple became as popular as it is now, the cult of Apple, right? I won't buy a PC. PC, no. <laughs> right? And this idea of resonance where people put Apple stickers on their books and on their cars. I thought I saw a hand. Yes? This may be too granular of a question. I'm curious around innovators in the market and MVPs for startups mm -hmm. where they aren't yet at the salient, but they need to get to resonance to survive. Yes. And yet the MVP provides inherent limitations mm -hmm. in terms of user experience and what your perspective is on the whole MVP strategy mm -hmm. and how robust it needs to be when you're first going to market it. So, I will say that in a few slides, we're going to talk about a way that a firm can best uh, use its resources, especially a smaller a startup firm, by abdicating some of the work to its consumers, to its customers. That customers can actually work for you, and you can outsource things like innovation R&D to customers if you create a relationship where it's more of a partnership. It becomes a win-win because the customer gets to put their fingerprint, so to speak, on the product and on the experience, which makes them feel more uh, wedded to the company, right? It also makes them feel more empowered. But the company wins because now someone else has just provided ideas, uh, done some of the communications for it, and so on and so forth. So it's a means of really strategically allocating your resources. And we'll talk about that in a minute based on some experiments that we've done. So you may think this notion of consumer relationships and trust is silly, but I'd like to give you an example from Jonah Hill, a twice Academy Award nominated actor. Instagram, not too long ago, changed its privacy policy where they decided uh, a couple years ago that basically they own your pictures and they can do with it what they wish. So here comes Jonah Hill, who has about 14,000 fo uh, followers on jo uh, Instagram. And he says, Instagram, you were my favorite app, and you stabbed me in the back. I feel like I just married you and you slept with my best friend. That's intense, <laughs> right? That's a feeling of betrayal. But if you pay attention to what's going on in the digital space with customers, you'll see stuff like this all the time. Not just negative, but vows of love. My husband's vows weren't as romantic as some of the things I see. <laughs> Check out Taco Bell's Twitter feed. There's something happening with the person who would eat Taco Bell, that there's a cult of Taco Bell. They know it's not healthy. They're not trying for it to be healthy. And they feel like it's their kind of buddy who's providing them the grease that they need <laughs> after a long night out. So can you trust a machine? Can you trust a brand? Sounds preposterous, but is it? So I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the experiments we're doing here at MIT. First is trust in wearables. We are doing some experiments. I, I do this in conjunction with the Media Lab, where people wear wearables, and we are varying the time at which the wearable is telling you you should be eating something healthy or not. And we vary the form of that message, right? So is it detailed about calories and that sort of a thing? Or is it more heuristic based, where we see a picture of an apple versus a picture of an ice cream cone? Or a smiley face versus a frowny face? This is the kind of stuff that we're doing here. And we've come out with some really interesting results we're still analyzing that suggest that when you're in the moment, less detailed information, more picture information, is far more effective because your brain can process it quickly. You don't need to read the numbers. You don't need to look at the caloric uh, 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 content. And so we can think about how we can nudge for better health. Another thing that I'm doing here at MIT is facial recognition. Now, if you've ever used Facebook, you know that the next time you post a photo, you're likely to see pre-populated a tag of a person. It's a little disconcerting because they know who's in the photo before you've told them who's in the photo. But that facial recognition research we're using here 
to understand how your machines can read your emotions and really make up for your limitations. For example, we know that when you're in a particular mood, your decisions are affected. If you are in a great mood, you're likely to be very creative, you're likely to think more inductively and integratively. If you're in a bad mood, you're likely to attend to details more. Right? You're likely to detect errors and problems. This is simply a mood. And we know that because of these moods, there are effects on your choices or your anticipation for the future. Put someone in a really good mood, make them feel confident. They don't feel like they need life insurance. They don't feel like they need to save for that purchase or that emergency down the, down the line. And yeah, I'll pick up the tab, why not? Drinks on me. These kinds of attitudes form from the moods we have now. And people in good moods think that they're going to stay in good moods and are therefore less risk averse. We know that, for instance, if you go shopping, the old advice, never go shopping for groceries on a, and on an empty stomach, right? Because you're not really good given your mood or your state now, at anticipating what's coming down the pike. And you will think that you'll be as hungry then as you are now and buy a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need. So what we're doing here is we're using facial recognition technology. This is what's called deep learning. So with deep learning, what this machine does is it has an intelligence that's able to take pictures. Uh, here, 75 countries people all over the world. And they're able to take nodes. So the corner of your mouth, the corner of your eyebrows, eyes, etc. So that if I look at one individual person, I don't need to know what you look like, Corey, when you're skeptical, because I know what everyone else looks like. And that machine, via the deep learning, knows that a slight tweak in your eyebrow or your mouth means that you're skeptical now, or you're enraged, or you're happy, and so on and so forth. We're using this technology to understand how we can have more of a partnership between humans and machines, where the machines know, for instance, when driving, you had a late night last night, and you probably shouldn't be driving, and we should take over. Or if you're shopping for an important product like insurance or a health-related product, how skeptical you are, how happy you are, how attentive to detail you are, and things of that nature. Whoa, hello. We've encountered a problem via Microsoft. Yeah, apparently. Let's see if we can get this back. Sorry, guys. Oh, here we are. Everyone who doesn't have a Mac right now is feeling pretty good about themselves. <laughs> All right, let's find you here. Okay, so I'd like to show you some experiments that relate to the consumer exper experience, but I'm showing you that this facial recognition technology and this facial emotion technology is helping us to understand the limits where people feel like, OK, take the decision off my hand, versus where people are like, you know what, I want to make the decision on my own. Don't tell me what to do. And that's where we think the real frontier is. Understanding when people want a machine to take over, to optimize, to make up for their limitations due to biases and heuristics, versus when they don't want machines to take over and feel like the machine may make a suboptimal decision and that they may be more satisfied if they themselves make the choice. So some exper experiments on consumer exper experience and trust. We created an app called Dream Car for an automotive company. And in this app, we tested three independent variables. The first is the amount of customization that you're able to have in this app. How many things are you able to create yourselves? The second is whether or not you're able to discover new information. 
as opposed to the information being kind of fed to you like a baby bird and prepackaged. And the third is the degree of social embeddedness. That is, whether other people are using the product at the same time and you guys are able to interact with one another, kind of like in a social media context. So here's what this concept app looks like. First, we ask you to choose your style. It's a game, so you get to design a car, your dream car, if you will. And we find out, are you a dog person? Are you outdoorsy? Are you an on-the-go parent? Are you into business, green, high-tech, et cetera? You kind of choose what kind of person. Choose your own adventure, if you will. And then once you've chosen it, you get to design the interior of the car as well as a scene that includes the exterior. So you can design the car from the inside, the outside, and things going on around the car. We give you the items you can use to put together the scene. So you can play, and you have choices based on your preferences. Yes, you had a question. On what basis is choose your style? I mean, a lot of people here, I'm sure, are thinking, well, why would I have to choose one of those? Can't I be both outdoorsy and high-tech and dog person. Yes. On what basis did you choose those attributes? Yes. So we did a factor analysis to choose these attributes in advance. But people were able to play this game, and you could be more green-focused in one iteration of the game, and you can come back and be some dog-oriented. It's just a matter of the uh, accoutrement that you were given during the game. So customization. If you have high customization, you, can you got more of these options to choose from. And with discovery, after designing your car, you were given information about ways you could learn about more about the types of cars that you designed. So it says, oh, you really like sports cars. If you want to learn more about sports cars, we're going to give you the opportunity to go to blogs and find some sports cars, or go to real official car sites and find real cars. We varied how much discovery, how much of a path you were given to basically learn more and discover more information, in particular informal information via blogs versus formal information via, via official car sites. And then last but not least, we had the presence or absence of social networking where people could comment and people also had message boards. Here are the results. We measured key dependent variables, consideration, preference, and trust for the brand. And we coded qualitative data as well. We created a structural equation model to identify the path that people take. And we measured brand relationships across six dimensions. What we find is that there are essentially six kinds of relationships that people have with their brands based on these results. The first is identified as stranger. And stranger is a relationship. Stranger doesn't mean you've never heard of the brand. It means the brand is in your life, but it is tantamount to a stranger in that it's not something that you think about, important for you. You could have mobile, for instance, a gas station, be in effect a stranger, even if you purchase mobile gas on a regular basis. So this is a different conception than the traditional conceptions of loyalty, which are typically based on repeat purchase. This is based on, in fact, your choice preferences and how easy it is for someone else to come in and replace you. The next level past stranger is do not like. So now we've gone from I have no opinion on you whatsoever to oh, I have an opinion and it's not a good one. And there are brands in our lives that we interact with, but we don't like it. Cable companies, <laughs> right? And so, once again, if we merely look at this through the lens of traditional loyalty, we'll say, oh, you've been a loyal customer. I love it when I get my cable bill. Love, loyal customer, but in fact, I, I'm sort of they're being held hostage because I don't have the option. Up the hierarchy, we have I deal with them because they get the job done. Now, this is repeated purchase, and there is some loyalty here. But recognize this loyalty is based purely on functionality. 
real lack of emotionality here, which means that if your firm is described as such, if another company can serve the same function, you can be replaced. Because all they care about with you is that you get the job done. That's all you're bringing to the table. The next level is a fling. May sound strange, but a fun fling actually is regularly used to describe relationships with different brands, particularly luxury brands. When people sort of dip their toe into that world, race cars, these kinds of high intensity, high emotional brands where you say, I've had my fun, thank you, and good night. Hope to know. This is where they say, I don't know you well today, but I hope to know you soon. This is a very high potential relationship. Many people use this to describe luxury brands who don't own the brands themselves, right? So if you've always wanted a BMW, but you drive your Chevrolet. You describe it as I don't know you now, but I hope to know you someday. And then the ultimate is friend. You are a friend to me. You are loyal. I trust you. All of the things that you've said before. What we find is that do not like and friend are the two most difficult relationship states to change as measured by pre-post experimental variables. And when you think about human-to-human -human relationships, that's true, too. If you say, I don't like that guy, it's really hard for you to say, oh, never mind, he's wonderful. And if you have a best friend, it's really hard for them to all of a sudden be someone you don't like. Yes? I was thinking, how much does environment play in this uh, analysis? Mm -hmm. Because um, just thinking about self for example, I have two cell phones here, and in the part of the world where I work, everybody wants an Apple, but everyone has to have a Samsung. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 even though it's good to have the Apple, and it's a uh, hope to know, yes. if it stops working, you will have someone who will immediately get the job it. done. So it's not as sexy, but how much does environment play in this relationship? With yes. Society? So the first part that you're alluding to is spot on, in that you can have within the same product category different brands that serve different roles, as you described. I would say Samsung is likely here, but uh, Apple, as you've described, is sort of more along these lines, right? There's a more of an emotional. Now, with regards to context, it depends on what you mean by context. If you mean digital, it plays a huge role. There are ways in which our digital structure is pushing us in directions that are quite different than the offline uh, structure. So if you mean context that way, that's true. If you mean context in terms of the presence or absence of social networks, other people, this also plays a huge influence. Turns out that when people make choices that they believe are being observed by others, they tend to stick close to the mean, right, to avoid something that is perceived as untoward. Also, there are replicative effort, eff effects where if everyone's choosing such and such, you're more likely to choose it as well, particularly if you're closely tied to these other people. There are other network contextual effects, such that when it comes to reviews, we decide whether to trust it or not trust it based on who's writing the review. For instance, when it comes to compliments, if you are complimented by someone with whom you have a strong tie, you are likely to downgrade how much weight you give that, even though you love and trust that person. Why? Because when my mom says, you look nice today, I said, oh, mom, you have to say that. But if a stranger says it, I say, oh, this person had no reason to do that. It flips, though, when the valence is negative. When someone with whom you're strongly tied gives you negative feedback, you're more likely to weight it for the same reasons, because they care about you, because you trust them, because they're not being petty. Whereas if a stranger says something negative, you're not going to give it as much, as much weight. So when you say context, Context is big. Context can be the platform. Context can be the social 
context in terms of presence or absence of social networks. Context can also be whether the platform comes to you from the brand or whether it is a neutral platform, like a blog, for instance. We saw that uh, these blogs have a greater influence than brand-sponsored content. So context is, is, is complicated, but yes, it makes a difference. Yes. I was curious, because uh, for myself, yes. I'm, I'm skeptical that I have a relationship with any brand beyond the first three Chevron on this slide. Mm. So is there, is there a test I can take? Yes. Because <laughs> 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 uh, yes. I'd be surprised, if I, as I'm just curious if you know of a test. You I know, that's funny. My husband says the same thing. <laughs> I find that men tend to think that they're more, yeah. as you've described. And so my husband said, I don't care about brands. You know, I wear khakis and blazer every day. And then when it comes to categories that are high involvement, it's a different story. So he really loves doing outdoorsy stuff. And so come time for a chainsaw, it must be a Husqvarna. OK? <laughs> is, that job, is that job done thinking? Or is no, no, no. That's up here. That's reliable. And he would love a tractor made by them one day as well. <laughs> I love when I talk about my husband, he's but not is here. There a test, like, is there a behavioral test I could see somewhere? There's no test, but the, the moderating, the variable is whether or not that's a high involvement category. So you might think about MIT Sloan. Paid a lot of money to come here, and look at you, you're back. And you're wearing the logo proud and you know on the on the chest. So Is Dave here? Okay. So that's a high involvement category, right? And so that's really the variable that determines, and people don't realize which categories are indeed high involvement. I would also like to say that though these are the two most difficult to be affected by an app or this type of platform, stranger and hope to know are most affected. That means if people, you can take a test, you can ask people where they are at the beginning. And if they are here with you or there with you and hope to know, you can have a greater impact. So therefore, your resources should be allocated toward those people if you really want to make change. And these people, you're probably not going to get them. And those people, you just want to make sure that they don't break up with you. In the remaining time, I'd like to just mention a couple things with regard to the data. One thing you can notice with this six-tier hierarchy is that when you look at trust, there's almost a linear relationship between trust and each of these relationship levels, where in the red, you see the greatest negative coefficient for do not like and the greatest positive one for friend. This is important because when we put that as a mediator into our model, it mediates about 65% of the effect of liking this app on the resulting consumer brand relationship. But one thing you're seeing here is co-creation. And I want to leave you with an underscore of how important co-creation is. The traditional organization now has porous walls, the digital organization, if you will where you have platforms where people are being asked to self-manage, to provide information. Your bank wants you to, instead of going to the teller, manage your account yourself on your phone. So does your insurance company, so does everybody, really. And you see many, many, many examples of companies that are, in essence, getting you to do their work for them. It's a brilliant resource allocation strategy, these platforms. And digital has really created a revolution that's permitted this. What I want you to think about is that this is a two-sided collaborative phenomenon, where, for instance, if you have an intelligent plug on your wall, I'm willing, from a customer standpoint, for you to know what I use, when I use it, and how much I use it, and what I'm using. If I feel in return, I'm getting something, much like the friend relationship that was mentioned over here. And that's the difference between something that's innovative versus exploitative. And from a firm standpoint, 
If you have all these data, are you leveraging it? That's the difference between leveraged information and wasting information. So when we think about this balance between the consumer and the firm, we want to think about things in terms of co-creation. And let's use stories. We used stories in experiments where we got people to share stories online. Stories online are pretty common. They're everywhere. And what we did is we said, well, stories are powerful for choice. We know this from research. They affect the degree of memory and encoding. And they also affect how much you feel connected to a brand. This is established research. So what do we do with co-creation? It's no longer B to B, B to C, it's B to B, it's C to C, it's B to C to C, C to C to B, the alphabet soup. People are making stories and sharing it. Brands are sharing stories with people, and it's going all different directions. I'll show you quickly three experiments that we have done that have proven that co-created stories are far more persuasive and impactful in creating trust in consumer brand relationships than anything the brand could come up with itself and anything the consumer could come up with him or herself. We did this for BMW. We varied whether this YouTube channel was brought to you by the firm, brought to you by consumers, or both. We did this for Suruga Bank, a bank in Japan, where we varied whether the context was the brand's website or a consumer website. And we, com and we varied whether the authorship was made by the company, made that by the consumer, or made by both. And we did it again for a company called Mass Mutual, a financial services company. We varied the context. This happens to be Facebook. We varied the story, whether it was brought to you by the company, by the consumer, or both. That's the common thread with each of these experiments. And here's the theory. Co-creation leads to trust. And there's a positive relationship between trust and the relationship. When you get consumers to co-create the content, to feel like they have skin in the game and it is reflective of their experience, it is far more persuasive than when the brand creates content or when the consumer alone creates content. And that's where we should be going. Here's what it looks like. When it's made by both, it has a positive and significant effect on the perceived authenticity. If it's made only by the individual, people dismiss it and say, well, that's just Joe Blow. Maybe he's a fanatic about this company. I downgrade it. If it's made by the company alone, well, you just want to sell me something. This is a persuasion attempt. But when it's made by both, it's perceived as more authentic, real life, and genuine. Yes? Sorry, maybe I'm an outlier and a skeptic. When I see an individual saying something tied up to the image of the firm, I naturally get the feeling, OK, the firm is paying this guy. There's something in it for them. And they're not as original as they would be if they were by themselves. I'm glad you brought that up. It only works when it is perceived that the individual did this without compensation and remuner remuneration. Meaning, if there is a contest, or like lots of firms do, like us on Facebook, they mean nothing. Waste. If you go, for instance, to Instagram or to Twitter, though, and you see someone writing about their experience, and they're tweeting, or they're adding the company, or if you see the company retweet something that someone wrote unsolicited, that is far more impactful than just saying, like us on Facebook, or here's a contest, do this for us. So your, your instinct is absolutely correct. I'm run out of time, so I'm just going to leave you by saying, there's a lot going on with digital and technology. I want us to remember, we cannot take an over-socialized view nor can we take an under-socialized view of how this is affecting human choice. The goal is for us to find the sweet spot between where people feel comfortable saying outsourcing to companies and to technology, make that decision for me, versus when they feel like this is the decision I want to make for myself. And that's the stuff we're working on here at MIT because we believe that it's no longer machine versus human, 
but rather we're all be going, becoming integrated with technology. Thank you, and uh, please keep in touch.